Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome to Jazz Alive at the University of the District of Columbia. I'm Cheryl Hawkins and I'm senior producer and programmer with UDC Cable TV. It is really nice to see your faces here at the UDC Theater of the Arts. Uh, we've been caged in for close to two years and so it's really nice to get a little freedom to come out and be with each other. Um, so I want to welcome you to this evening's event and for those of you who are with us via UDC Jazz YouTube or the DC Jazz Festival Facebook live stream, I want to welcome you too. For us here at UDC Jazz Alive, Jazz Alive is not just a saying. For us, it includes things like our jazz studies program, our exciting calendar of events, our research and outreach programs here on the campus, and of course, the Felix E. Grant Jazz Arch Archives, all right here on the campus of the University of the District of Columbia, the city's only public institution of higher education. We're really proud of what we do here. So one of Jazz Alive's signature programs is Alan Johnson and Meet the Artist on the Bandstand, which you're gonna experience with us here this evening. Alan initiated this series in 2015, and over the years, he's conducted about 30 sessions. So those of you who have been to those sessions, um, you know that you're in for a treat. But those of you, if this is your first time, you are about to be entertained. So we wanna thank DC Jazz Festival for this opportunity to co-present with them for tonight's program as a part of Oren Evans's Artists in Residency with DC Jazz Festival. Jazz Alive has been collaborating with DC Jazz Festival since about 2015, and we can truly say that this has been an enjoyable collaboration. So in addition to, UDC, to DC Jazz Festival, we want to thank the UDC College of Arts and Sciences, the music program, UDC TV, and Prosperity Media for their support of this evening's program. And now to keep things moving so we can get to the music and the conversation, please welcome to the stage with a warm round of applause, the president and CEO of DC Jazz Festival, Sonny Sumter. Good evening. Uh, I know you came here for the music, but one of the things that I have to do in my role is to thank the funder that made the Jazz Creative Residency possible, and that's South Arts. I don't know if Sarah Donnelly is here this evening, but if she is or if you're listening online, thank you for really creating that project so that mid-career artists, who most of them are so outstanding in their art form, are able to have real residencies like uh, the one that we are experiencing this week with Oren Evans. And so I want to give it up to um, South Arts, which is uh, supported in part by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and uh, the Mellon Foundation. I'd also like to thank the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities for their support of this evening's performance. And so without further ado, let's, and I, I know, let's put, we can't hear you out there uh, uh, in your living room, but as much as we can, let's make up for it and give a warm, huge round of applause for Alan Johnson and Oren Evans.
All right, we are here. Again, welcome. Welcome, everybody. It's my great honor and privilege to have my man, Orrin Evans, here with us on tonight. Yes. Orrin Evans, again, was, or is, artist in residence this year for the DC Jazz Festival. And um, I'm so glad he could make it tonight. And um, we're gonna, you know, just talk a little bit, but you know, I like to play, so hopefully we're not gonna talk too much. <laughs> but um, Oren, um, I've been checking out some uh, interviews, uh, one of the interviews with uh, Mike Moreno, which I thought was a great, great interview. And um, you briefly talked about your, you know, coming up uh, in Trenton and going to Philly. Um, can you, you know, just kind of briefly talk about your, your journey from Trenton to, well, as a child, I guess. No, no, no. Well, basically, uh, if I, if I, I always, I have to claim Trenton because Trenton people be in the audience sometimes. And, uh, <laughs> And they know, they're like, you, you keep saying you from Philly, but I knew your mama and papa, so I had to <laughs> make sure that I claim Trenton right. all the time. Um, but uh, I had a great time growing up in Trenton, but uh, I was really, at that time, into riding bikes and BMXing and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I moved to Philadelphia, I moved to a neighborhood with no kids. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was just me. So then I started falling in love with the, the piano. Mm -hmm. So I always look, because uh, we always had piano in the household. Yeah. So I always look at that uh, trip from Trenton to Philly um, as one thing that is, is really important in my life, because I may have never really gotten into piano if I stayed in Trenton. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's the trip, and that happened around sixth grade. And so okay. instead of riding my bike, I just started banging on the piano. Oh, you yeah. know, banging literally. <laughs> I wasn't wasn't playing, but banging, and that's. At all yeah. Are there any memories, I guess, from your early childhood um, that you know, I guess stick out um, before Philly? Oh, without a doubt, because uh, my family, my mother was a opera singer, my father was a playwright, so we had you know little cabarets at the house and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, so I just, I really remember those little parties because the kids would be sitting Indian style. And, you know, someone like Sonia Sanchez might have stopped by and is reading poetry, wow. you know, or my mother was singing and uh, some other well-known pianist was there playing for her. So it was just really, but I didn't think, I didn't think that was special, honestly, yeah. <laughs> at that time. Yeah. I, I had no idea. I was like, everybody got James O. Jones stopping by. Like, I just, <laughs> I thought that was, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't until I was older and I was like, oh, wow how blessed I was to have that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think things like that may not have seen, seemed, uh, ins I mean, seemed insignificant. I mean, to us as a child, we probably didn't know, but it probably, you know, it yeah. probably just seeped in, you know. Oh, without I a believe, doubt. I believe that, you know. Oh, without a doubt, without some, a doubt. You know, some kind of DNA, you know. Exactly. Um, so uh, also, uh, one other thing I kind of checked out in that interview, you said, I guess I'm kind of skipping ahead, but when you moved to uh, Philly, you started uh, working at a, a jazz club. Or you were running a jazz club? Yeah, that was when I was still, I was, that was my first year in college. And um, I would come back, when I left Philadelphia, I was at Rutgers, which is right down the road, about 45 minutes from Jersey, about an hour. And I came back every Monday because this club in Philly had a new jam session mm -hmm. uh, on Mondays. So I drive and bring the students, you know, some of my friends down, and we'd sit in. So the first time we went down there, we sat and we had our whole thing worked out, and I was, you know, being a little MC on the microphone. <laughs> but little did I know they that night they had just fired their manager, so they came over to me that night, and I was under 21 at the time. Mm -hmm. I, just, I always used to lie about my age, uh -huh. but so I'm sitting there, and they said, um, "Would you like a job?" as the manager, and I started managing and booking, that's exactly the club. I met Kenny Garrett, and I booked Kenny Barron on a, a gig there. I wow. had some great things, yeah. you know. 
this is at 19 years old. I was 19. They didn't know that though, but oh. <laughs> they eventually found it out. But that was just, wow. you had to fill out one min too many papers. Yeah. <laughs> so it seemed like you had, you know, like an inkling of sort of the entrepreneurial uh, <laughs> bug in you at the age of 19. Um, now you, you know, you, I guess you're running a your record label. We, you know, we'll talk about that. But um, did you know? that, you know, music, I mean, as a pianist, you want to be doing music as a pianist, or at that time, you thought you were going to be kind of running a jazz club, or? I knew I was going to be around music. Okay. And and that I was going to find a way to make money from music. You uh -huh. know, I knew that at that time. I didn't know whether it was going to be, you know, I, I had no idea whether, whether I was going to play in a wedding band, be a sound guy, go on mm -hmm. the road, play. I mean, my first... Going, my first tour was with Miles J on this smooth jazz tour, hmm. opening for this unknown saxophonist at the time, Boney James. Oh, so, okay. So, like, I didn't know. I, yeah. Like, I had no idea. I was just, it was just music, and I was happy to play music at that point. Whatever, you know, whatever, play it or be a part of it, be behind the scenes. Yeah. That's what I knew I wanted to do. Okay. Were you at uh, Rutgers at that time again, right? Mm-hmm. And who were you studying with at Rutgers? Well, of course, Kenny Barron, and uh, also jo Joanne Brackeen. Uh, and theory-wise was Ralph Bowen. Um, so I learned a lot from him as far as theory. And my lessons with Kenny Barron were just about life. And, and yeah. we, we would just get together two pianos in a room and play. Oh, and man. he would give a new tune each week. Yeah. And you had to check it out. And it was, just, it was really just the opportunity to fellowship with him that was really important, you know? Yeah, I remember um, seeing uh, advertisements of Kenny Barron being at Rutgers, and I was like, man, I, I wanna go to Rutgers, because Kenny Barron, I mean, mm -hmm. I was a point, you know, in my career, that's all I, like, listened to. It was Kenny right. Barron, all the records, you know, because I wanted right. to go, you know, study with Kenny Barron myself. Um, let's go back to Trenton. Uh, is, is, what, what is Trenton known for? Now, I'm asking this question for a reason, because just as far as your influence, your early influence, you know, just, is it, is Trenton, what is Trenton well, known, known for? I, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. But, that's, that's real. <laughs> musically, uh, anybody, was, was it, isn't it like, what was it? Y'all know? I hear people talking. <laughs> anybody out there? What is Trenton known for? Okay. Okay. All right. Good. I'm just glad I'm not the only one. I was <laughs> kind of making me feel special. But uh, but one of the things, <laughs> um, there's some great as far for me. You know, I, I got a chance to connect with Johnny Coles, so one of oh, the yeah. artists that came out of here. Okay. I'm just talking about art now. So that's yeah, not yeah. Totally. Then there was a uh, great, the, one of the first killing rap groups for me. Poor right, poor, poor righteous teachers came oh, out of Trenton, um, Trenton. And uh, a lot of good things. But I don't know what it's known for, but I do know that uh, the logo was Trenton Makes, The World Takes, which is about make, come on, y'all. <laughs> oh, you know. I know, they're not really, they not going. You know Trent, now. Trenton style. Google it. Richie Cole. Richie Cole, yeah. Yeah, I played with him, and he would always yeah. say that on band. Trenton style, baby. Exactly. I remember. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, Richie Cole, I remember that. Yeah. Um, um, I actually want because I want to play some more, but um, I'm gonna ask you one, you know, one more question, and we can we can hit um, Philly. What now? What drew you to Philly? Uh, well, that's where both my parents are from, no matter what. Okay. So like, it, there was always, you know, that was the magnet. You know, going back there, my father went to Temple, uh, so we went back there because of all my mother's family was there, and yeah. my my father's. Uh, Mother was still there, yeah. so I was getting back to family. None, of, we didn't have any family, only in Trenton. Okay, in Trenton it was just us. Yeah, so everybody else was in Philly. Okay, you know Philly. How would you? Of course, Philly has a has a thing. How would you describe Philly in a sound like? You know, everybody. You know, there are great musicians that, of course, come out of Philly. It must be something in the water. You like, you know. Does does Philly have a sound to you? Definitely, there's a there's a 
I'll find the word. <laughs> um, a relaxedness to the beat okay. that I hear, whether whether it's stuff from Gamble and Huff or whether it's, you know, jazz like Mickey Roker and Bobby Durham. It's just a, a relaxed, you know, when I first moved to other places, mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, it was a, just a little, a little more urgency in the beat mm -hmm. other places. Yeah. Um, but Philly, I really, to, to the point that I kind of thought, of, you know, people in Philly <laughs> were dragging. Okay, I'm just oh, yeah. here for, for yeah. me, you know, and then I figured out, no, I'm just, I wasn't old enough, you know, to really understand, like, where the beat was. Yeah. And so it's just a really, even when you hear McCoy Tyner and he's, and he's playing those fits and, 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 and mm -hmm. every, there's a, just, just, just a lope also to the beat. You know, you listen to Trudy Pitts. Mm -hmm. There's, and all these, everybody's probably wondering exactly what I mean, but it's just, it's in there, yeah. you know? It's like that Prego sauce. It's like, <laughs> it's in there and you yeah. get to hear it. And, and you can hear it and not just Philly people. Yeah. I can hear, man, I can, DC Chicago, DC. D yeah, DC definitely has that. You know? You know, you got, you know, Shirley and she's way behind the beat, you know? Yeah. Shirley is like, yeah, exactly. Over here, the beat is like, you know? Yeah. You know? That's one thing I think we have in common as far as the Philly sound and the uh, DC sound. Even um, one of my favorite pianists, Ruben Brown, you listen to Oh, yeah. You listen to him and Steve, no, well, listen to Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Exactly. That thing is like. It's, it's relaxed. It's, it's grown <laughs> folks. It's yeah. Close, you yeah, know. yeah. Ain't no hurry. Right. <laughs> I remember playing with a drummer from New York when I was much younger. And man, I thought he was Russian. Yeah. Same. You know, but I had to learn that everybody has a different, place a different beat. Yeah, yeah. there's not, not right or wrong. Yeah. You know. Unless um, it's Russian. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, yes sir. Yes sir. Um cool. So so you brought me brought in some music, man. Um What do you you tell me? <laughs> okay, so let's let's uh try this uh tune by the great Jerry Allen. It's called Feed the Fire. Our University. Jerry Allen. Rest in peace.
Just how we rehearsed it. <laughs> oh, man, it's a pleasure playing with you, man. Oh, same, same, Yeah, same. man, I, I, I rarely get a chance to do, of course, do this. You know, we hardly ever have two piano players on a gig. Um, let's uh, talk about your, I guess, uh, some of your career, your influences, I guess. Um, I'm going to throw out this name and share what, what that name means to you. Uh, Sid. Sid. <laughs> uh, see, Sid Simmons, um, growing up in Philly, there was Sid Simmons, Sam Dockery, Shirley Scott, Trudy Pitts, Eddie Green. These are all like great piano players that I had a chance to sit next to. But what was also special about Sid Simmons, one, he was still out there really on the scene and mm. hanging and listening to music. And he played at a club called Ortley, so I got to hear him like almost every week. Mm -hmm. um, but even more important than that, we live not far from each other. So I would drop my kids off at school and go to the grocery store. Uh -huh. And um, you know, Sid didn't shop for like the week, he shopped daily. So I, that's what I, what I was doing at that point. I'm like, what do I feel like cooking today? My wife would go to work, and we'd meet up at the grocery store almost <laughs> every day. And I, I really, those those days were special because we talked about music. We stood mm -hmm. in the line. Just, that, that was our, like, meet up for almost an hour, and then we, wow. we'd go home. So, um, and every time I drive by where he used to live, I think about that. And those were the moments that really mean a lot. You mm -hmm. know, and growing up in Philly, it wasn't always at the club. It wasn't always... Right at their gig, um, it was just running into them and getting to know everyone as a human, you know? Right. And, and, and just getting a chance to fellowship with them, whether that's John Swana, Charles Fambro, you know, it, just like you have here, mm -hmm. Philadelphia was, is, was, you know, because a lot of people have moved on, yeah. and now there's, there's the responsibility is on, on us now. Yeah, we but, were just uh, talking about that, yeah. yeah. There is a wealth of um, information growing up in Philadelphia. Yeah, how, yeah. How tell us why that's important? Like, why just you know communing with the masters? Like, not just you know talking about what chord was that? What what sharp thirteen, sharp sixteen, whatever you know. Get all nerdy about music. You know, share why why is it important to? I mean, the simple reason of just seeing it in action. Mm -hmm. Everything you you know you you look at a recipe, you make it because you want to see what it tastes like once you put all the ingredients in there. And the, one of the recipes for being a successful person that plays this music is not only everything that's on that paper and, you know, and all the notes and the chord changes, the other part is the community and the fellowship yeah. with the elders. So if you're missing that part of the, the, the recipe, most of them taste bland Ah, uh, you, you you preach it, man. And you sound preach. bland, you know? So you that's why it's really important to make that that effort. You know, even doing one of those things I got better, you know, better at during the pandemic was, was just calling mm -hmm. um, some of some of my elders and teachers and just, just calling them. Because, you know, when we're running around, oh, I should call such and such. And next thing you know, man. Yeah. You know, so I, I really tried to make a point during the pandemic to reach out to all of those people and just let them know how much I care about. Yeah, I, I mm. noticed that about you. You're very, um, you're, you're very much in touch with a lot of the master musicians. And, um, you know, I noticed you, you know, I'm a name that we both love and dearly, you know, Mr. Ralph Peterson, our Uncle Ralph Peterson. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I noticed, you know, you were very close to him and, you know, looked out for him, and, you know, he used to call me too, and, yeah. you know, um, talk about, you know, I know you could go on for days about Ralph, but just how important he was to you. There's certain people in my life that uh, they met me at a certain time and changed my life, mm -hmm. you know, so I can't even imagine Wow. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. I can't even imagine being the pianist that I am. Yeah. Without someone like Ralph Peterson. Yeah. yeah. You know, and um, he got on all our nerves. He was a pain in the ass. 
But um, he introduced me to so much music yeah. and so many opportunities. And um, there's, there's not much else I can say about it. I hear you. Um, the record, the most, one of the most pivotal records out there, of course, Art of War. Man, check that record out. The Art of War. Um, just one, I don't want to, you know, make you. <laughs> you already did. But this, the, yeah, the people want to see this. This is, but this is real, <laughs> you know. This people want to see this. No, but um, just talk about just look. I know, just the 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 the, the record date. Um, I want to know the insides because you know you, you know people talk about the record, but like, tell us a little bit about the record. <laughs> 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 The, Some the, stuff the I can't tell you. But. Okay, yeah, that's what I like to hear. See, that's the that's the stuff we want to get to. You know, but, but uh, you know, well, one, the record came out on 9/11. That's the, right. That's right. why it's called the Out of War. It was released that day. Um, but Ralph honestly wanted us, us being Jeremy Pelt, Jimmy Green, Eric Rivas, and myself. He was starting his new young band. Mm -hmm. Except his new young band had already had several records out under their own name. Right. Revis was on the road <laughs> with Brand for Marcellus. So so every record, we can tell plenty of stories on uh, <laughs> Ralph's battle to to tame what he hired. <laughs> you know. So when you listen to when we listen to, we we all talk about we're doing a tribute to him in May. Yeah. When we listen to those records, we remember each argument and what it was about. Oh which tune we were about to cuss each other out before we played, because Ralph said something, and he was like, we ain't no little boys, so we went through that, you know? But that, that's what, that was always, but we never, we knew that that was what made us play the way we play on the bandstand. Mm -hmm. And the last day that I saw Ralph, we all went to his house. Beautiful day, mm -hmm. uh, a pile of musicians, Lucas Curtis, yeah. Uh, Craig Handy, Eric Rivas, Jeff Tain Watts, we all just drove up there. Um, and we were hanging out with him, and he played his, his next record, the record that was about to be released. Mm -hmm. And they told old stories and everything. And he looked at all of us and he said, uh, I have no regrets in how I played. He said, every time I sat on the bandstand, I played with all my heart. Yes, he did. He said, and there's very few people that can say that. And that's that's true. He played with all his heart when we only wanted half of it. Right, 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 exactly. <laughs> but he did it. Yes, sir. You know, he yes, did it, and I admire him for that. Yeah. He he showed us all that we were worthy, whether we knew it or not. Mm -hmm. The last um, time I spoke to Ralph, we were, actually, we were getting ready to record. He wanted to do this band with me, Chris Fun, Gary Thomas, and Sean. And he wanted to do it in the December before he passed. And I'm like, why is he trying to hurry up and do this record? Why is he trying to hurry? Yeah, I want to do this record. You know, you know how he is. Like, we couldn't get together on the last week of December because it was Christmas. So we want to do it in May. It was gone, you know. And it didn't know, and I didn't know why. I didn't know why he wanted to, you know. He knew though, because that knew. was a double record. It was supposed to be that band, and the other he was going to bring. The old band, band. So yeah. They were gonna do he both. didn't mention that. Yeah, he was going to do both of us. And, and, you know, some of us were just like, nah, man, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't yeah. do this. Yeah. And I knew he wanted to. I knew he needed to. But honestly, if you get to leave a last record like he left, <laughs> two, two last records that he left, one was with Brandon Goldberg. Man, everybody needs to check it out. It's like Ralph a couple months before he passed, but mm -hmm. playing with so much art. And then his last record, uh, which was the big band? Oh, trio. No, no, oh, that's right. Yeah, he, mm -hmm. he did it at his uh, at, at his, his studio, house. at his yeah. house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So, um, speaking of Maestro Ralph, we have a couple of his tunes that we want to do. Do you want to do the the waltz first? Yeah. Let's do okay. That. Um, Ralph wrote a tune called Mom. M O M.
Uncle Ralph, mom, supposedly, I'm sure it's written for his mother. Such a beautiful tune. Um, Ralph was a special, special guy, excellent musician. Um, yeah, we, we're going to miss him. But his music lives on, so we're going to keep playing it. And you will hear this again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you will hear this again. Um, where should we go now? Um, uh, as a composer, um, you know, you have your, you know, your big band, you, and you have so many hats you wear, man. First, how do you have time, you know, from Captain Black to your record label, and then you playing with everybody, you know? How do you? <laughs> no, I, I mean, it definitely, it seems, I seem way more busy to everybody else than I actually am, <laughs> but uh, which is great, which is good. Yeah. Um, but still call me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, honestly, with, you know, I, it's a, I have an amazing support system, mm -hmm. not only uh, in my house with, with my wife, uh, Captain Black Big Band exists because of so many other amazing arrangers and organizers, you know, we, it, it's definitely a group project with people like Todd Bayshore and David Gibson. Yeah. And uh, then with the label, uh, Luke O'Reilly and Jonathan Michelle oh, yeah. and Caleb Willer Curtis are three people that are on um, my label. And, and Caleb is also a um, webmaster. Oh, okay. So he helps out in those things. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, John Michelle helps out in other areas, and so does Luke. So yeah. it's it's when I, you know, everybody sees on social media, I say the, the word and the term, the village. Yeah. But it really is. You know, we all mm -hmm. just come with what we can do to, to, to help, you know, yeah. get what needs to be done, done. Yeah. Um, and it makes it easier. Where it's, I'm, I'm, Although I'm busy, I'm never carrying this all on my own, you know, yeah. with a great support system around me. Yeah. Well, I want to get... You know, I want to be hired as a, uh, an engineer. There you go. <laughs> there you go. We, we'll talk. Yeah, <laughs> we'll talk. But, um, no, I love, man, you know, I love what you're doing, man. Um, you know, you seem to find time to, you know, be on the cutting edge of this music. And you've been doing it for many years. I remember meeting you at the old Twins, you know, mm -hmm. up on Colorado Avenue. And, um, you know, and I just watch you. Uh, grow and play with so many great musicians and um, um, we were talking about Uncle Bobby Watson. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me why you love Uncle Bobby so much. <laughs> well, I mean, definitely. When I first moved to New York, that was my first gig. Uh, first on the road gig and going out with, I mean, if you want to like get ready to go on the road for the first, I think I was, what was I was, I was turning, I went out in February, I was turning 22, so I was still 21. Uh -huh. I was about to turn 21, 22. And um, that was my first time out on the road with Bobby Watson, and it was a split tour. Essie at Essie it did some of it. Um, Rodney Green, who was even younger than me. Yeah. Was, well, no, that was the second tour, that was the second tour. Um, but the first tour was Will Calhoun. Wow. Um, and, okay. and John Benitez. And, I, and then I went back out again and with Curtis Lundy and Ronnie Barrage. So just, you know, and I was 20 something. And uh, so <laughs> it was, it was, it was yeah. a lot, a lot to learn real quick. And I ain't yeah. even talk about on the bandstand, yeah, yeah. you know, it was yeah. just a lot to learn. And, and, and they were always, I mean, this, <laughs> this is a goofy story, but I like it. Um, <laughs> We were in like the north of Italy, a town called Balzano. So I was young and I was trying to be all like, <laughs> you know. So the menu came and I, I didn't, and even now I don't ask questions because I eat everything. So I'm just like, oh, I'll try that, you know. And then if it comes, I'm like, okay, cool, that's good. Mm -hmm. So I'm just open like that on the food tip. So. Oh, I think I heard this story. But go ahead, go ahead, <laughs> tell it anyway. So I ordered and I was like, okay, I had a mushroom risotto. And it's like, I'm sitting around the table, it's like Ronnie Barrage, Bobby Watson, Curtis Lundy, Jack Walrath was there too. 
and then the people from the festival. So I'm clearly the youngest one there. And my food comes over, I'm still trying to be all bougie. And <laughs> sitting there eating my food, and first thing out of my mouth, I look up and say, mmm, tastes like rice. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> never mind, you had to be there. <laughs> uh, Curtis never let me live that one down. When he start calling you rice. <laughs> And then Heidi wrote a song about it. Oh, she so. said, oh, that, that's that song about no, you? No, 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 it's not. We know that song. Yeah, we know, we know that song. Yeah, yeah. Rice. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's one of Heidi's hits, man. I know. That's one of her hits, man. Everybody in, everybody in D.C. know that song. We love that song. Oh, that's hilarious, man. I, I, I watched the uh, interview with Mike and uh, another musician that was with you. It said uh, he wanted... <laughs> yeah, Alfredo. <laughs> Alfredo. Oh, oh, yeah, that was the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was the other one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. So, uh, as a composer, man, what what things um, influence you besides music? Uh, I mean, for me, it's, it's experiences and people. Mm -hmm. You know, ninety percent of my tunes are written about people, or experiences of you know places I've been. Yeah. But they're all related to you know relationships and people yeah. um, in my life some kind of way. And, and that, that inspires me. I mean, you know, and then the other thing that inspires me is uh, a commission where they, they <laughs> pay you to write. Oh, uh, yeah. I get really inspired around those times. Yeah, well, let's talk about that yeah. because <laughs> musicians, we always don't have time to be inspired. Exactly. So, <laughs> so that so helps. How do you... <laughs> Oh yeah, I want you to write a composition, uh, you know, and, and tomorrow, we, and we'll pay you this amount of money. Oh, I come up with some amazing stuff, <laughs> you know? But it, it also comes, sometimes you sit down and you write, and you're like, oh, this is amazing, and you go back to it, and you're like, I already wrote that, you know? Oh, yeah. So I was saying to somebody today in one of the master classes, that's the, the, that's the time when you change up what's on your iPod. You change up, you change up something in your life to get you know, change up a store that you go to or whatever. Yeah. So that you experience something new to bring back to the table when you need to compose. Because sometimes we get caught in the same, you know, we get caught in the same harmonic, yeah. you know, journey. And, and it's sometimes you just got to go and listen or see or experience something different. Yeah, yeah. I, I've f I found that out myself even during the pandemic. I mean, I was writing tunes every day and um, just, but, you know, sometimes you just have to, just step away from your instrument yeah. and step away from music, you sure. know, and because sure. um, it become it can become overwhelming, you know. Um, let's uh, let's see. Um, maybe we should play what, one or two last ones. Three. Oh, they talking about three. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if there's any other questions I want. One more question before we play uh -oh. our last. <laughs> I mean, our last, we can do two songs together. Like, okay. um, just as a working musician for, for, you know, I'm sure there are musician, young musicians out here. Some of my students should be here. Um, when you, you know, you, you've played with a lot of people, a lot of great musicians, and leaders. Um, what things do you think about? Um, or how do you, you know, how do you, Think about accompanying different people. Do you does your style change? How do you adapt? Do you adapt? How do you think about that? Like playing honestly, it took at a certain point. I had to realize that that person hired me, and and that's not something you you. That's not something you get the first day, you know, right. your first couple gigs, mm -hmm. but um, in my journey and and that I'm still going on now. I had to realize, okay, they called me. They know what I sound like. Right. You know, so be me, you know, with respect to, to what they need on the bandstand, but still they hired me. Right. You know, so don't, and, and sometimes when we get when we get a, a gig with somebody else, uh, we listen to the music, we're like, I'm going to play it just like that person. Oh, yeah. And I had to get like, no, they hired me. Yeah. You know, so it, that's the first thing, really spend the time checking out all the elders, putting that information in your book bag while finding your own voice. You know, take yeah. that journey to find your own voice. Yeah. Um, I played with a certain saxophone player. And uh, this was, uh, I was probably in my 30s. 
probably in my 30s, yeah. And he said, I'm not going to say the musician name, but he said, I want you to play like so-and-so. And And I'm going to tell you, so-and-so wasn't McCoy, it wasn't Herbie, it wasn't Wynton Kelly, it wasn't Oscar Peterson. It was a a contemporary. Right, 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 right. And I held my mouth Mm -hmm. because I almost said, well, won't you go call him? Yeah. He can do the, won't you get him to do this gig? Yeah. You know, and at this age, <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to play the music, yep. but you, I'm not going to try to play like this person exactly. or that person, you know. Exactly. But, um, but I, w- I don't want the students to get, get the wrong idea. Yeah, I, th- I was thinking that's, about that's, that. That's, yeah, yeah, that's a journey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want well. the students, to, you know, I mean, we're all students, but I don't want the young musicians no, to get the wrong idea. Like, you know, you don't have to study the masters. Like, I got my own sound. Well, you know, yeah. you're going to you have your own find sound. Find your sound. It's yeah, a, it's a, but you still have to study the history. But anyway. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> I think that. <laughs> and don't do the gig. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I appreciate you, man. And um, thank you. Um, we thank you here at UDC. And DC thanks you, you know. Yes, let's give it up for Mr. Wo- Mr. Thank Orrin you, thank Evans. You. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, let's see. Oh, I wrote a song for Oren. I, I, I try to make it a point to uh, write, a, write a composition for my guests. And um, I wrote a song for Oren. And um, maybe we'll, we can do that one. And then go into uh, Smoke Rings, maybe. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to do uh, an untitled song I wrote for Orrin. It's called Song for Orrin. <laughs> um, and then we're going to go into another Ralph Peterson composition called Smoke Rings. And we thank you for coming. God bless you and good night. Oh, uh, before I, and thank you to DC Jazz Festival and the University of the District of Columbia for hosting Professor Corey, thank you. UDC staff, DC Jazz Festival staff, sound, video, interweb, all of you, everybody, thank you.
Orrin Evans, everyone. The great Orrin Evans. Alan Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Thank you. Uh, just so you'll know, thank you. Thank you. April 25th, we will be having a great celebration for our brother, Howard Kingfish Franklin, here at the university, featuring the great alto saxophonist, Bruce Williams. So put that on your calendar, April 25th. Thank you very much. God bless you. Good night. On your way out, be sure to take Orrin Evans home with you. We are selling a CD outside. So please, this was a free event. Please uh, take a moment to stop past the CD table and take Orrin Evans' latest recording uh, home with. And is that the one with Kevin Eubanks? Okay, so there are a couple of them out there, and you can choose. So thank you. Get home safe, and thank you for coming.